Welcome to Living in Color. I'm your host, Farah Nasser, and today we're going to be talking about representation in rock music. Why there's a lack of POCs in the genre, people of color, what it's like growing up listening to rock music as a visible minority, as well as normalizing the conversation of POCs in rock. Today I'm joined by Dave Batch, guitarist of Sum 41, and Dan Chen, who is a radio announcer on Q107, a rock station. Guys, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having us. Dave, I'd love to start with you. Uh, how were you introduced to rock music? For me, it, uh, it kind of all started uh, through Cousins. But uh, if I could pick a specific moment, it was, uh, it was when my uncle actually showed up to the house one day. And uh, he had uh, an old basket from a grocery store called Knob Hill Farms. I remember that store, right? the black basket. Yeah, yeah, and this thing was like chock full of CDs, like overflowing, right? And I'm like, oh, this is amazing. Like, just started sifting through this thing. Foreigner, or like Led Zeppelin, Genesis, all these kind of like eclectic records that I had never been exposed to. So I, I ended up uh, picking out this one. I really loved the cover of it. It, it uh, was Led Zeppelin Three took it out of the case, put it in the CD player, and just got terrified of the immigrant song. You know, the, the first, like, ah, and I was just like, nope, shut it off. I was like, that's way too scary. Can't do that. And then just kept on going back and back and back. And how, how old would you have been at this point? I would have been about eight years old. OK. Right? And, wow. And yeah, it really, really changed uh, my perspective on listening to music and the fact that uh, the same kind of grooves that I was introduced to with reggae, calypso, soca, you know, hip hop, those were inherent in the rhythm and blues aspect of rock and roll. Huh, so you felt some sort of connection to that. Yeah, and I didn't really realize until I was able to actually think about it later. Right. Yeah, what drew me to it. Uh, Dan, what about you? I mean, you work at a rock station. How did you get introduced to rock music? Uh, well, I started with my parents. Oh. My parents turned my brothers and I onto a rock and roll oldie station that's no longer around, 1050 Chum, and that's where I discovered Elvis, mm. the Beatles, the Stones, Buddy Holly. And for me, it was, it was sort of that was the foundation. And then I would rummage through my dad's records, and I would see, like, Led Zeppelin, all the Beatles records, The nice. Doors. And that was sort of like the laid the groundwork. And then when I came up to like being a teenager, I had a similar story where my cousin was throwing out a whole bunch of CDs. <laughs> but then I picked up these two CDs that I heard about a lot about from, from buddies from school, but I didn't really know anything about it. Pearl Jam's 10 and Nirvana's Nevermind. Mm. Those are the mm. two CDs, my first two CDs that I ever owned. Put them on and I was hooked right away. That was it. That was it. For you guys, did you see yourselves represented in the brands or in the in the CDs or with the bands that you were listening to? For me, at the beginning, no, because I it just wasn't available. Uh, for me, it was just I, I knew what I enjoyed and what I liked, and I just gravitated towards that subculture. And a lot of my friends who just so happened to be white were my friends. Uh, I didn't think of it on a on a on a ethnic or, or racial level. Um, but then, you know, you start to kind of go through uh, the bands that you enjoy and then you just start discovering things like mm -hmm. James Eha of the Smashing Pumpkins and then mm -hmm. some of the guys from Linkin Park. And I was like, oh, okay, cool, this is awesome. <laughs> and James, could, he's, the guy can shred a guitar and he's really, really good. And there's, there's affinity there, for sure. Smashing Pumpkins, for that reason, will right. always have a special place in my heart. And they've created some of the best songs I've ever, I've right. ever you know, had the pleasure of listening to. So, yeah. And Dave Baxter of uh, Sum 41, so. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah. It, it, at first, uh, upon discovering, um, mm -hmm. I didn't really, I didn't really think about it either. I mean, it was it was similar, but um, then all of a sudden, I started hearing bands like Living Color. Uh, they had a great song called uh, Cult of Personality, and uh, Vernon Reed was this killer guitar player that was just slaying that guitar, and in a heavier way than I was used to seeing, you know, African guitar players playing. And then all of a sudden, you know, I was introduced to Bad Brains. And seeing them play, it was unbelievable because it was this underground, raw kind of experience that I don't think I was even ready for at the time because I don't think I gravitated towards them uh, until later on in life. But um, beginning, no, there was no, it was completely innocent from my end. 
When you were growing up and when you were kind of entering this, were you ever made fun of, Dave, uh, being a POC and being in a band like Sum 41? Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, a specific story would be mm -hmm. uh, we used to play a local club in Oshawa called The Dungeon. And uh, The Dungeon was kind of famous back then for having a uh, kind of like a Nazi skin contingent come to random shows. Wow. Uh, my cousin and I were in a band called 747 at the time. And uh, we were on, we were playing with a band called Figure Four for any Durham punk rock heads out there. <laughs> but uh, the, uh, during the show, we ended up uh, getting spit on, called racial slurs, like pushed, you know, water poured on us, stuff like that during the performance. Are you kidding me? No, From not the at all. audience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not everybody in the audience, just the, like I was saying, the, like the, the group of, of Nazi skins. And, uh, you know, it, it, as, you know, Freddie said, like, the show must go on. So we finished our set, and we just kind of all got together afterwards. And, you know, we were like, you know, that was really rough. That sucked. And uh, one of the guys from Figure Four came down. Mm -hmm. Because while we were playing, we kind of noticed that it cooled off a little bit. And uh, it was the singer of Figure Four. I'd come to the, uh, the backstage room and was like, Hey, those guys, don't worry, you can load your gear out. Those guys are gone. Like, we took care of it. And we're like, oh, amazing. Thank you. You know, it, so there was always that uh, kind of backing love within the core of the scene. But there were, like, people that, that decided that they were going to try and ruin everybody's time. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it, it breaks my heart, though, that you were on stage and had to, had to deal with that at some point. Like, it's, I mean, do you think that would happen now? Uh, it depends. Maybe different pockets uh, of the world, maybe. I don't know. I can't speak for mm -hmm. sure, but um, I'm sure it's happening to many different races, not just the races that were involved in our band. Dan, did this, anything like that ever happen to you? Nothing like that, no. Right. Uh, and I think that's, that's, that's a... Thanks for sharing that. That's oh, really, yeah, that's really cool. For me, it was like I, I, my buddies, my Asian friends would would mm -hmm. kind of rag on me sometimes. Like Dan, what are you doing? Like, what are you? Why are you being so whitewashed? Why are you being a, a Twinkie, a banana? Oh, you know, dude. if anyone doesn't know that, it's, it's a term that people use to, to describe Asians who are, you know, yellow on the outside, white on the inside. And um, I usually laugh it off, and I've never really subscribed to that notion of, of being whitewashed because I never, I, I've never liked that term. To me, it suggests when you're whitewashed that there's, there's, you got to get rid of something. Right. Like you got to, you got to wash something away. Something's not right. And for me, that's never been the case. Like I'm, I'm very proud to be Chinese, Chinese Canadian. I'm proud of my culture, proud of my heritage, of, of my history, of my roots. For me, it was just more, as I mentioned before, like I, I just gravitated towards a subculture that I found kinship with other people. And yes, predominantly they are white. Um, when my buddies, my Asian buddies were asking me, hey, do you want to come to a club? I'd be like, nah, you know what? I'm going to go check out this live band at the Horseshoe instead. And that's just, that's that was just what, what you were into. That was just yeah. what I was into. Um, so, um, so for me, it was just, it was, it was more of what I was, I, I didn't experience that sort of racial tension in so much as just, I just did me. And I was just happy about doing that. And if people saw that <laughs> as a threat, then that was on them. It wasn't on me. It's funny, on this show we talk a lot about, uh, you know, uh, discrimination both externally but also mm. internally within our communities as well, right. where it's kind of like you're a cello. Why, are you, why do you like this? You should be into what we're, right. you know, most of us are into, and that, that can be difficult as well. What advice do you both have for, for, for young people right now that are um, maybe in a similar situation, and, and both, again, through that external point and internal point? Um, I would say just move to a place that is more accepting if you're, if you're in a place that isn't. If you can't handle where you're at, there are great places. Toronto, we were just talking about it before the interview. Mm -hmm. Toronto was a great place for uh, at, like multicultural gatherings and being together and being in a place where you're accepted as a human being. And um, I mean, of course, Anywhere in the world, you'll, you'll run into the odd uh, person that isn't accepting of who you are and what you represent. But 
you know, it, both are everywhere, but we're in a time now, I think, personally, um, where on the street level and on the human level, um, we are a lot more accepted than we used to be. And I, I think it was even better for us than it was for our parents and their parents. And mm -hmm. to me, it's something that's a work in progress, but it's, it's working. I would also add to, to own your distinction, embrace your difference, embrace your quirkiness, your, the things that you think is lame, <laughs> embrace it. Yeah. I think there's a sense of personal freedom that happens when, when, when there's authenticity, right? Mm -hmm. And when you, when you let that side out of you, I think it's just an explosion of confidence that comes out that wouldn't otherwise be there, right? Uh, I wanted to just thank you both because I don't know if there's been conversations like this in, in a public public way like this. Um, I learned a lot and uh, it's just fascinating to hear your perspective and Dave especially thanks for sharing such a difficult story uh, no as you did and music is something certainly that we can all agree on brings people together. Yeah. Absolutely. So thanks again guys. Thank you. Thank and you. Thank you for watching Living in Color. Thank you for watching Living in Color. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you have an idea for a future Living in Color episode, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Please leave them in the comment section. I came up with this idea because even though the foundation of rock music was partially built on rhythm and blues, a form of popular music of African-American origin, we haven't seen a balanced representation of persons of color when it comes to commercially successful rock artists.